Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Carl Garth, and welcome to our latest edition of the Champion Chat with Councillor Alison Champion. Good afternoon, Alison. How are you today? Hi, Carl. I'm fantastic. Happy to be here. <laughs> As usual. <laughs> And for those who haven't uh, already tweaked, uh, because Melbourne is in lockdown, we are doing this with the wonders of Zoom, multiple mm. locations. Yep, so we are. Got to love the fact that uh, it's just not limited anymore. That's right. And I remember doing quite a few um, of these last year with my fellow councillors, but also for organisations who needed me to speak uh, at events that ended up being online. So I'm quite used to this. <laughs> it has become the new normal. It has. And there is no reason why we can't continue kicking goals and achieving tasks just because we can't be in the same room. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and probably, uh, I guess, really the big news this week is the Tokyo Olympics, Brisbane getting the Olympics. Um, have you, are you getting ready to sort of late nights, late afternoons watching the Olympics <laughs> this year? Um, I don't know if you know, Carl, and some people know, I actually don't watch television. <laughs> right. So I, do you know what? I used to love watching the tour and I still love it for the scenery. I just haven't watched any this year. Um, and I love Wimbledon and I've invested much time overnight watching Wimbledon uh, and tennis in January. I would used to have in my old life, uh, January was tennis month and I would have the tennis on day and night for the whole of January from sort of like Boxing Day through to, you know, Australia Day. Um, and now in my new life, I really, I don't have a lot of time to watch television. However, however, I am aware the Olympics is coming to Tokyo and I am aware that there will be a lot of late nights for a lot of people. And actually, originally you were from the Sydney area. Were you living there when the Olympics were in Sydney? Yeah, so, um, so that was in 2000, if I remember mm. rightly. Uh, actually, I was just out. I'm thinking of the Commonwealth Games in 1988. I was, I was actually studying in Newcastle at the time. But in 2000, I was actually here in Melbourne. I had moved to Melbourne um, officially. Um, and I do remember the football season that year was pushed forward. So the first games were played in summer, essentially, mm -hmm. here in Melbourne. And I, my first AFL game was played in 34 degrees and I was sunburned. <laughs> and that's, be <laughs> that's because... So much for a winter sport. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought, oh, my God, I'm so glad I'm not playing. Uh, so um, that's, that's you know, that was my, my thing, my memory of the Sydney Olympics. Um, mm. Things were pushed around to make sure that the Olympics got most television coverage. Okay. Is yeah. there actually, do you actually have a favourite event uh, when it does come to things like the Olympics? I, I actually do. I love the rhythmic gymnastics. Okay. Absolutely beautiful. Very closely followed by the figure state skating. Okay, so summer and winter. Yes, yes. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and it's interesting because, you know, um, thinking about the Olympics and especially in Australia where sport really is uh, something that we identify our nation with. Mm. Um, and we, I think we bat very high or punch very high above our, uh, our weight division when it comes to our success on the global scale. Um, and the fact that our communities are so heavily entrenched in sport. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the question I've got there is, are you yourself involved in any local community sports or, or recreation at a personal level? Um, not a team sport myself, personally. Um, I do attend the gym um, for, my own, for my own physical and mental wellbeing, uh, which, of course, I'm not doing right now. <laughs> um, and as I'm in lockdown, as in my own isolation, I can't even leave the house. So I'm, I'm doing nothing at the moment. Um, however, uh, my boys uh, are actively involved in their sports. So both of them play uh, with the Eltham Wildcats. Oh, and, yeah, and they've been playing for many, many years with the Eltham Wildcats. They started as, um, you know, part of the Aussie Hoops uh, teams when they were you know, like four or five. Mm -hmm. And they've just moved their way up. Um, both of them are currently playing in an under 21s team and Nikki's 17 and Cricky's 14. Right. So, so so it's actually really convenient that they're both in the same team. Yeah, That's, that normally doesn't happen. No. So very handy. Uh, so I've watched them a few times and yes, a lot of the other players are twice their size. 
and, and look, it's just fun. It's fun to watch and they're there for fun. Um, and Cricky also plays baseball. He plays with the Lowell Plenty Research Blake Baseball Club. Yep. He's been doing that. Uh, he expressed an interest two years ago when we opened the batting cage, the new batting cage down at Glen Auburn Park. Mm -hmm. And he came along and stayed for the opening and he had a play in the batting cage. And he said, oh, mum, I'd really, I really want to play baseball now. <laughs> So he now plays baseball and he's actually considered one of the leaders, the lead, like, you know, a little, a little leader, if you like, in, in the club, in the group, which is lovely. It's a beautiful club, but we can talk about that later. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, well, uh, look, I certainly watch them play. And mm. uh, look, those examples just highlight where I was going with this in that our communities in Australia, we have so many sporting options, mm. you know, something that makes us, uh, I think, very lucky. Mm. Um, and look, that then probably would be possible without a lot of the, the support that comes from, you know, local government, state government, federal government. Obviously, mm -hmm. sure, we, you know, we hear people ask for, they would, they would like to see more, but, um, you know, I still believe from a, at a community level, uh, there's a lot out there. I mean, if we look at the councils and, and the range of services in, in sport, recreational and leisure that they offer, I and mean, then you've got ovals, courts and fields, all through uh, the Banyu area, uh, mm -hmm. leisure and rec centres, the, the Watermark uh, Aquatic Centre, but also you've got pools over at um, Eltham. Ivanhoe. Yeah. Ivanhoe. Mm -hmm. uh, community and youth centres, even golf courses that are actually run by the local governments. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess really that leads me into my first question. What goes into the management and responsibilities that council has to provide community sports and recreation? Um, council actually works very closely with the leaders in a sporting club. It's very much a team effort between both organisations. So the council officers tend to work very closely uh, with, with the, the presidents and the secretaries and the treasurers and the uh, vice presidents of a club, a sporting club. And they're the leaders. And I find that our, our leaders have generally have a really good connection with certain members of our staff in the sport and leisure environment, sport and leisure teams. Yep. And generally I get the message that this particular officer is fantastic and we're so glad to be working with them because they help us create the results we need to create. So there's, there a real, with. Mm. there's a real long-term relationship actually yeah. between the clubs and, and the, uh, the council and the officers. That's exactly right. And that is how it needs to be seen. And, and so the clubs themselves, um, um, their leaders, their leaders are responsible for being that, being leaders, and they bring their own skills and knowledge from their lives, their businesses, um, their workplaces. They bring those to their roles. And the whole point is to connect with each other in the club, in, in the leadership teams that they have, and also to connect with um, the coaches as well. Of course, that's another member of a leadership team, the coaches. Mm. And, and then also then connect with um, the leaders, our officers um, in, man, in, the, in the management roles um, within, within the council to create, you know, a safe, a safe, effective, clean environment that everybody is welcome. It's a big, it is a big responsibility. And so council provides some funding for the club spaces, whether it's the grounds or the club or the, you know, the, the, the change rooms, the toilets, the function centres they have, the buildings, the, whatever, the club rooms, uh, the lighting, that's a big one at the moment, lighting. <laughs> um, and, and cages, things like batting cages and, and practice, practice pitches, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a whole lot of facilities available in a club for, um, for the communities and, and then the council officers help with maintaining it. So both parties are responsible for working together and being in really effective communication with each other to ensure the best outcome for the clubs. Okay. So, 
to, to take that uh, another, uh, just go a bit deeper on that one. When it comes to, say, the local sports grounds being maintained, known, uh, updating the lights, things like that, council would, would work with the club and, and be one of the people, uh, one of the groups helping to do that. If we look at um, parks uh, around the place, um, council would have obviously the main ownership there for updating the parks. Um, we know that a lot of our parks have uh, fitness uh, orientated uh, yeah. um, equipment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, what about that? I mean, can you give me a little bit more insight as to, especially when, when we look at our our leisure activities in those parks and some of the things that council provide, mm. uh, what they're doing around that maintenance support, um, upgrades, et cetera, and how that's planned, who they're working with on that. Yep. Um, so when it comes to, you mentioned that the fitness, little fitness, outdoor fitness centres, um, they're sort of cited. There are places that are cited um, that would be effective to install them. Um, and then they're just... I mean, they're part of a rotation. So the maintenance of those is part of a rotation, if you like, just like our, our, um, our public parks and garden spaces, they're part of a rotation of managing the, the foliage um, that's there. Um, so they're on a timetable, if you like, you know, just all through Banyol, there's just this timetable of what else, you know, what's the next um, place we need to look at, what else has to be looked at. What did we treat there last time? Um, so we sometimes we might treat, um, you know, the weeds like blackberries or whatever. We might treat a space at a certain time. That's recorded. We don't need to return to that space or the officers don't need to return to that space until X time. And then it's managed. It's, it's, it's just managed on a rotation basis. And that's throughout the whole, the whole of the municipality. Um, what we also find, too, is that sometimes members of the community just let us know, oh, you know, there's graffiti's one that comes up actually. Um, you know, these toilets have been graffitied. Can that please be removed? Or, um, you know, there seems to be a lot of um, ivy growing in this space here. Is it possible for council to, to visit that and just remove the ivy? Um, or there's, there's um, this piece of equipment's damaged. Is it possible for council to please just repair it? Um, and so if we're all working together and keeping in touch with each other, then, then those, those things are maintained as, as well as the ongoing process calendar that, that council has. Okay. And what also has to be considered too is that some, some spaces might not be council owned. They might actually be park, uh, sorry, Victoria Parks property instead, in which case council collaborates with Victoria Parks to you know, do whatever needs to be done there. Okay, so it sounds like uh, quite a lot of um, uh, interaction uh, and, and different groups involved. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, we talked about in previous podcasts, especially when we talked about town planning, was the actual projected growth of Banyul um, out to, I think it was 2030 or 2025, um, mm -hmm. and the growth was, was quite large. Now, mm -hmm. we've talked about where we're going to house people, but... Five years ago, I was actually coaching basketball mm. and I saw a report um, because there is obviously there'd been a shortage and still is, I guess, a shortage of basketball and especially netball courts and facilities mm. and various other uh, facilities. And I guess the point that I'm getting at here is with that projected growth, obviously that means more young people and even older people wanting to be involved in sports, wanting to participate. How does council plan future development of sports and, and recreation facilities? Well, um, there are a lot of facilities that already exist and the it comes back to the zoning, if you like, the zoning spaces. Mm. So when I look at, when I think about Braniel, look, I was in a conversation yesterday with a resident about um, the netball club, bowling club down in Chelsworth. Uh, there's an issue at the moment in Chelsworth with regards to the, the netball club and the bowling club and the space being used and how it's being used and how many members there are and, you know, what, what the future of that is. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was brought up is that, well, there's Cyril Cummins Reserve, which isn't really being used anywhere like as much as it could be. 
um, because it's it's a little bit run down. Mm. So it's a case of looking at the whole of Banyal and saying, well, we have currently, whatever state they're in, we have this number of basketball courts, this number of netball courts, this number of bowling clubs, you know, etc. This number of football fields and and cricket pitches and essentially cricket and football are on the same space. They're, they're sort of shared. Um, and what's looked at, um, and this is again where clubs are in communication with council, um, and coming back to our, you know, our facilities are a little bit um, older. They're a little bit unkempt. How do we um, how do we work with you as council to um, improve the facilities. We would like X, Y, Z. How do we how do we improve those? And then the, the conversation goes down the path of well, how you, know, you you need this, this, and this. That hasn't been looked. This hasn't been addressed for several years. Hmm. This was only addressed last year. This has probably been a long time, even more than that. Um, that you haven't you know this hasn't been changed or renewed, and probably is a bit worn. Um, or these trees have grown enormously. Um, you know, in the last X number of years, and they look like they're starting to, you know, push up the, the court um, or the green we've had in the Monty Bowling Club. I've just recently been working with the Montmorency Bowling Club mm -hmm. with regards to, um, you know, a tree at the edge of their bowling um, bowling green and, and managing the root system so that the, the tree still survives and the bowling green is still flat. <laughs> So there are conversations around that. How do we manage the space that we're in? And, and the officers really do work very closely with, with the leaders in the clubs to make sure the best outcome is, is all around for everybody. But coming back to your, your concept with the regards to things like population growth and, yeah. and sort of run, it's almost like running out of facilities for the number of people who are being born or coming into the community. Mm. So the census does need to be used. Um, and it, look, it's just very much a case of, again, we really communicate closely with the clubs and it's up to the clubs as well as us as councillors and the council officers to be really open-minded about how many members there are, how many members are we expecting in the next five years, let's say, or 10 years. Can the club with these facilities cope with what's there? Mm -hmm. If it can't, how, what do we do to be different? How do we how do we do something with this space in order to um, you know retain the numbers as well? Because it's about numbers in clubs as well. That's really important. Because um, if you don't have the numbers in the clubs, the clubs die off. Um, it's it's and so it's it's a case of working really well to make sure that the numbers of people stay. The place is attractive enough and safe enough. That the numbers will stay and then that will help recruit more numbers um and so we look at we look at the spaces that we have and we you know we look at okay this is working really well and you just this this ground just just needs a bit of improvement mm -hmm. um whereas look this is really really run down and this part this you know these courts are hardly being used how come these courts aren't being used um or used enough is it because the club has really low numbers they've diminished over the years or you know what is it? Is it something to do with the space itself? Is it not accessible? Is it overgrown? Is it damaged? Is it unsafe? And then we revisit and then we look at that and go, well, how do we, how do we work with the club to improve that? So let, let's delve into that one a little bit more because um, I know, for example, um, McLeod College mm. uh, is actually building more uh, netball courts yeah. Uh, yeah. there. Now, is that... Uh, with the assistance of LGA or is that actually through the state government? Because I know that being a, a public college, mm. um, obviously there, there's state government involved, but is mm. there LGA in that as well? Yeah, so there's a bit of both. This is again, this is another perfect example. Um, this is, sorry, this is a perfect example. Another one is a Lower Plenty Football Netball Club. But this one at McLeod, this is the perfect example of working together, being in conversation with the users of the space, um, and the school as well, obviously, and, and then the state. So anything inside school grounds is state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anything outside school grounds is local government, really simply. Yeah. Um, however, it's a case of just working together and going, right, how can council be involved in this or what capacity can council be involved in this? 
improving McLeod College facilities and how much responsibility is state. Mm. And the club and, and the college as well, because obviously principals um, need to be involved in these conversations as well. So there are, you know, in this case, there are three stakeholders yeah. to be involved in that. Yeah. And, and then if I take that to the next part, you're talking about you know, looking at the quality and, and the current state of, of certain assets that are around within the, um, within the city council limits. Um, if I was to look at, I think it's uh, Waratah uh, Special uh, School on uh, Banks of Street in Belfield. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that they used to have uh, a couple of, um, well, I know they had a very big uh, area, indoor area for courts for basketball, netball, volleyball, et cetera. Um, I was actually driving past that a little while ago and thought, there was one that I hadn't seen much use of. And to be honest, it actually resulted almost being closed down. Do council sort of look at those and go, right now, long-term plan, we need to be um, pushing for those to be refurbished or um, reused, reopened, whatever it might be? Council has to, is responsible for thinking extremely strategically in this space. So this is a really good um, example you're bringing up. So my understanding of the Banksia site is that yes, there was there was a lot of conversation around turning it into two basketball courts. Mm -hmm. Council chose to not do that. And instead of spending 15 million or whatever it was on setting up two basketball courts in the Banksia site, they invested 5 million in the Latrobe basketball stadiums. Yep. So our communities can genuinely access Latrobe basketball stadiums of which there are more than two basketball courts. Okay, so you see how we've got $5 million as a shareholder or a stakeholder in, in a project that, that isn't ours, it isn't in Banyul, but it's right on the edge of Banyul and we have, we have so many of our families in Banyul that will use that. That's correct. And that's $5 million, as opposed to building our own by ourselves and using $15 million of the budget for two courts, which are in time, you know, as we were just talking about, not going to last. No. Mm. Now, let's so, take the great example there of council looking for partnerships. Yeah, exactly. Partnerships are the key. Partnerships are the key. Yeah, yeah. And this is where, um, you know, with the Elves and Wildcats, um, the Montmorency Secondary College site yes. currently has uh, two um, new safe working courts that, that mm -hmm. you know the players use every well every day, quite frankly. Um, and currently being built in that car park, there's a the car park next to it yep. that's now being ripped up. There is there is building in progress for an additional three basketball courts and car parking underneath. So we've still got a car park, yep. um, but we've got three courts on top. So that makes a space with five courts. Um, and there's that's you know a state government funding as well. So that's actually state government. That was a major promise at yep. the last state election that's coming ahead. We turned the sod earlier this year, March, uh, when we were out of lockdown, it was lovely, turned the sod. And that's, I was there last weekend. I was actually there walking around the grounds last weekend, having a look at it. It's it's going up really, really well. That will allow for five basketball courts on the Montmorency secondary site. And it's it's a combination of collaboration between the school mm -hmm. and the state government and local government. Okay. So, Alison, so we've, we've talked a fair bit there about facilities. Um, I guess one of the other things that... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, has been absolutely devastated over the last 18 months. It's actually been the competition of themselves. Yeah. And um, how much input has council actually had on decisions to run any of the competitions? I mean, do you get consulted? Do you have any input? Or is it simply up to the, what the state government says, um, what the leagues have been told or what they are saying? We are all responsible for responding to state government direction. When it comes to, you're talking about lockdowns? Yeah. When you're talking about lockdowns uh, and, and quarantines and so forth, 
uh, we are all under state government direction. And as I mentioned in our, in our last podcast, there were times last year when as the mayor and the deputy mayor, councillor Rick and our CEO, there were times when we would have conversations based around a decision we had to make there and then, Sunday afternoon, Friday night, whatever it was, based on a direction that came through from the state or the DHHS that day. Okay. We knew was going to change in another two or three days. So it's the same thing with our sporting clubs, our recreation facilities. They're under the same direction that the state government is under, not local council. Sure. So, mm. so, so understanding that part where, yes, during a lockdown, state government's going to say, you can't do this, mm. okay? Yeah. Now, that saw us have truncated seasons last year. It saw some of the organisations actually start to say, all right, well, we're going to run a shortened 12-week season or eight-week season or whatever it might have been, which could potentially overlap into another sports window as well. Mm. That's sort of more where I was coming from is, does council have to have an input or work with those stakeholders to try and find a common ground so that all of those competitions can at least have some sort of a season? Yeah. Um, one, look, one thing that springs to mind, I mentioned that um, our football fields also have our cricket mm. pitches in them as well. And our, this is why we have, you know, football, football netball clubs or football cricket clubs together and they they are they are it's understood that they work together that's just an understanding they work together now if they need a mediation from council officer they can do that um, but it's just understood that they're sharing the space and there's just an understanding that they as the leadership teams they will work together to make sure that their players get to play as much as they can um, as safely as they can on the best ground they can possible yeah. And like I said, look, if, if council needs to mediate or be in conversation about that, that's that they can. Okay. Mm. But okay. it really is up to, uh, it, it really is, and this is where it comes back to the first point that I was making, the leadership teams of a club um, do need to be able to collaborate and, and communicate effectively amongst each other and with, within each other's club and with each other's clubs as well. Okay. So mm. let, let's have a look at those clubs for a moment where, I mean, obviously, they rely on membership and also local businesses for sponsorship yeah, for their yeah. survivals. If they don't have those, um, to be honest, they're not going to last. And with those truncated seasons or even cancelled seasons, many of them didn't have memberships of, of, of um, participants coming through the door. Um, a lot of local businesses were looking at they had to pull back their own investments because they were trying to keep their businesses running. So was there any sort of support available to these organisations from council during uh, the last 18 months? You know, because again, even though they might not be running a competition, there's still the overhead of keeping the club actually operating, yeah. uh, uh, you know, going out and having some undo administration and things like that. So was there any support there for those clubs? Yeah, from council, yeah. So look, um, um, the exact figures from last year, I don't have, but I can tell you that this year we've addressed the fact that there is, again, like you said, you know, a reduction in the number of games that are being played, mm. not quite to the extent of last year. So we're, we're getting a little bit better, which is great. Um, but what council certainly did at the last meeting on Monday night, um, and this is available on the website, the minutes have came out a couple of days ago. Um, we, ha we revisited the support that council has for our, our sports clubs. Um, so there is, there is a certain number of fees. So the clubs do pay fees to council for using, for using grounds and so forth. And we've, we've, um, we voted last Monday night to reduce those fees by a significant amount, it was about 40%. We, we voted to reduce those fees because we've acknowledged that they're not doing their fundraising this year. Mm. You know, they don't, they're just not able to, to function as they were doing two years ago with all their fundraising activities um, and their, their, you know, their lunches and so forth that we pay for. 
and there's like there's one that's not happening on Saturday. The Lower Plenty Football Netball Club was was um, was having a, a women leadership lunch, mm-hmm. um, which which a few a few of us were invited to across um, the, the council and also our officers, our senior officers. And you know we paid out we pay our fees for the lunch, and that's not going ahead anymore. And that that would have covered you know that event if not a bit more for the club. Um, it'll um, it'll go ahead another time, I'm sure, but it's not going ahead. It's another one, something else, another fundraising activity that's not going ahead, yeah. as an example. And we're just very conscious of those things. Um, and so we've, we've just gone, look, you know what, in order to assist their um, their survival, again, um, we'll, you know, we can we can reduce their fees for them. Yeah. Mm. It's because like it, it is it is a team it is a team activity and i don't mean kicking the ball i mean no, no. keeping keeping a ground afloat keeping a, a mm. club afloat mm. which you know have the clubs ever sort of um approached council in the past to maybe doing sort of joint promotion of upcoming seasons so rather than saying you know clubs go out and they go to primary schools or go to high schools etc looking for new players but sometimes also um just promoting the leagues and what's available uh, because new people coming into the uh, into the city may not be aware of of what's available or what's going on. Does the council, has the, have they ever looked about with the clubs doing some sort of joint promotion of leagues and activities? Um, I'm, okay, I might be blind. I'm actually not aware of the club the, the councils and clubs working together to go and promote all the different sporting sporting clubs. I'm aware that the clubs do that themselves. So I do know that, um, you know, they have their open open days, if you like, or you come and try days. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that's, you know, they, they initiate those. Um, and because they've been going on year after year after year, it's kind of like something that goes in the calendar. Yeah. It just goes into the calendar. Yeah. Um, so every year, and like I just think of, you know, the... The, the clubs every year, depending on the season, there'll be something at the start of the cricket season, come and, a come and try day. Yeah. Um, and there'll be something at the start of the football season, the netball season. There'll be, you know, basketball, you can come along and try and have a play. Um, and if you want to join, you can join. Um, or they start young. You know, you get the, the five-year-olds um, in, say, you know, like the Aussie hoops. I mentioned Aussie hoops. Um, there's obviously, the you know, you've got netball up basketball, football, they've all got their young um, come and try uh, mm. clubs, groups um, that they can give a go to and just, and they're just doing basic skills, skill drills. That's all they're doing. Um, and maybe meeting other different people. Okay. So there's, there's always that. There are always those, but they are things that the clubs themselves promote. And again, it comes from the leadership. Mm. Mm. Uh, look, we talked before about the diversity of um facilities that are around for recreation and, and leisure. Probably one of the other things that I, I probably didn't mention was um, things like skate parks, um, sort of alternative recreational activities. Uh, do you know if council has, I, I know that there's been a few that have been recently built by council, mm-hmm. but is this uh, something that they've started to probably look a little bit further at? Yeah. There's a little bit of a brief conversation around um the off-lead dog areas and the skate parks. Uh, there have been requests for, for these, probably not as loudly um, as, as, as some other things, like the basketball we talked about, um, but they're around. So I know that um, I think Price Park in Viewbank has, you know, that's an off-lead, has an off-lead dog section. There's one in Yalambi Park. Yalambi Park's very well known. It's next to the Yalambi tennis courts. There's a big space that's fenced off uh, that people can, you know, take their dogs, take the lead off, and they can run around. Dogs can run around. Mm-hmm. Um, skate parks came that came to my attention. One of my residents actually got in touch with me about that last year, um, and she just brought up with, look, you know, there's uh, the skate, you know, is there a skate park somewhere in in Banyul, um, that we can use? And I know that Calparan, there's there's one in Calparan Gardens, um, which is a little bit higher and, and bigger. It's it's bigger for bigger bigger kids um, yep. and who are a bit more skilled. 
whereas uh, the, there's one in Alastair Knox Park, so that's in Millenbeek, but it's just over the border and, you know, the locals here also use it. But the one in Alastair Knox Park is smaller and it's great for beginners or young, younger people. Um, so they, they are they are around and we have had a conversation, we have had just really brief conversations around skate parks and, and where we can where we can possibly put them. And again, <laughs> as we've said before, it comes back to what space what yes. zoning do we have? How 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 much use can we make of the space and make it somewhere where people will come and visit? Very true. Yeah, well, and that's the other thing too. How accessible are they to people? Are they in the right area? Um, yeah, yeah, for that, for that, yeah. And look, when I think about the other question you were asking me with regards to, um, you know, initiating um, a, a club, club memberships, um, another one that comes up for me is um, the bowling clubs. Mm. Um, they often promote barefoot bowls. And mm. I've learned recently that that's one of the fastest growing sports. Of course, yeah. beer, oh, yeah. beer at genuine 1978 prices. I mean, how could you not? Why would you not do that? <laughs> yeah, <you're> right. <laughs> and it's fun and no one cares what you look like and how old you are and whether you can bowl or not. It's just a fun social event. <laughs> Look, uh, actually, one of the things we are blessed with in, in the Banyul surrounds is fantastic walking trails and, and um, parkland areas. But one of the things that, uh, and I know this is probably a little bit of a thorny issue, and mm. is there's been great upgrades in recent years, but considering how popular they are, but also considering some of the things that have happened in the last couple of years, especially to young women, is what is council looking to do to improve them and make them safer? Yeah, so there are there is a rebuilding program going on. So the Darabin Creek Trail um, is gradually having upgrades, mm -hmm. and so the paths are being made wider. Um, there there are symbols being painted on on the pathways to show left and right movement. So again, you walk on the left side of the road or you cycle on the left side um, of the path. So you may see part, you know, a, a cycle, um, picture of a bicycle or a picture of a walking person um, to show which direction to go in and which side of the path to walk on. Mm -hmm. um, so there are those, and again, that comes back to how much space is available mm -hmm. on that actual path site. Um, so council, um, you know, is, is going through that, that process there. Um, there's a big conversation at the moment um, to try to, with Northern Trails mm. to try and connect the trails out of the city and all the way up through to Diamond Creek and Hurst Bridge. And of course, that takes us through quite a few council, local councils, mm. Mm. As, well as, as well as state government areas. Um, so we're sort of all, all attempting to work on the Northern Trails um, program. Right. Um, there is uh, one, of, one of our residents brought to our attention, I think it was either last year or the year before, um, just the disappointment with the trail, part of the trail through Heidelberg. Um, mm. it, wasn't, um, it wasn't solid paved. It was very mm. worn down, run out, potholed, that kind of thing. And can council look into this? So, you know, council does that, um, creates a report, looks at a feasibility study, and I know it sounds really tedious and you're probably just rolling your eyes and going, oh, my God, just get on with it. <laughs> it's pretty clear that it needs doing. And it's not that it doesn't need doing. <laughs> it's just that the way local government works, a lot of projects start with a feasibility study and then we go into, right, yes, these things need doing in order for this project to go ahead and look like this to be effective. Hmm. Yeah, that's all. So it can take a few years. Um, the other one was the, tra the, the trail. So I will mention this. This is a really important one, actually. Um, part of the rail duplication process, um, which is going on between Greensboro and Montmorency, you know, the feedback that certainly we at Council got, it's actually a state project, mm -hmm. um, but because Council is, is really well connected with its community, the Council has received a lot of feedback and speak with the locals. Yep been noticed that the right the trail there isn't a space put in for the trail a, a cycle path or a walking path along right. the railway line yeah. which is so desperately needed 
um, and that hasn't been included in the project. And there are a lot of residents who are just going, well, it's a no brainer. Mm. If you're putting it, if you're duplicating the rail line, that's great. And then you need to also put in a bike path next to the trail line. So we connect, we connect through train, cycle, walking, and we get off the road. Yeah. Do you know? Um, so there's a bit of a, a disconnect there at the moment. I definitely think um, the widening, obviously space being an issue, but I, I believe that's definitely one of the things that uh, would be high on the safety agenda. I mean, we've got some great trails, but again, they have a lot of blind turns and you have uh, your cyclists suddenly going at 20, 25 kilometres an hour and a couple of running groups coming the other way can uh, suddenly lead to a, oh my goodness, which way do we go? Correct, yeah. And look, do you know what? This um, this does happen on the road. Yes. All right, this, this is feedback I get from my community when cyclists are on the road. Now, around, around here, a lot of cyclists, especially on a Sunday hmm. or, you know, during our lockdowns. Um, so our cyclists are out and about um, at various times of the day and they have every right to be on the road, just as anybody else has every right to be out on the road using it. Mm -hmm. The challenge comes not so much on the main roads. It comes on the local roads that are narrower. Mm. And we certainly find uh, in Sherborne Ward, in my ward, the cyclists love to, to ride through. They come through from Main Road Eltham. Mm -hmm. And they come along Main Road and they turn up Bolton Street and they turn up into Old Eltham Road, drive through Bonds Road and through to the um, acreage areas that way and then back along the um, Heidelberg Trail. Mm -hmm. So that, and it's a lovely ride. It really mm -hmm. is. What is challenging for probably not so much the pedestrians, but more the drivers. Um, what is challenging for them is that we've got some very narrow roads there, whether they're paved or unpaved, they're quite narrow. And as a driver, they're very conscious of the safety. Can I overtake? Can I not overtake? I'm driving at two kilometres an hour here. I do need to get from A to B. And the feedback that I hear is frustration. I've got three cyclists across, you know, across the lane yeah. rather than driving, riding single file. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, you know, conversations back from cyclists. Well, we've got drivers who just are not paying attention to us and, and they're just flying past us. And it's very, very unsafe. And they seem to just not, not want to be aware of us. So there is this ongoing argy-bargy maybe or ongoing anxiety around using the same road um, safely. And all I can ever say to that is you've just got to work with each other. Mm. You've got to be aware, aware of how you are forming on the road, where you are on the road, how you're overtaking, are you letting someone pass, are you slowing down for a cyclist, what other cars are parked on the side of the road? Who's coming out of their driveway? You've we've all just got to be very aware of our surroundings hmm. and not get upset. Probably uh, when you when you're actually in the uh, in the moment, it's not always the easiest thing to do. I know, I know. And this is this comes back to when you're driving, for example. Please be aware of where your phone is. Are you on the phone? What's, are you listening to a podcast? Are you paying attention to what's on the road? Or are you watching something on your phone or on your dashboard? When you're riding your bike and you're in a conversation with the person next to you, it's easy to chat with someone next to you. When you get right into your conversation, is there a car behind you wanting to overtake? Can they overtake? Or are they going to have an accident coming in the other direction? It, it's just being aware. That's all. And I know it's really hard when you're engrossed in whatever you're doing at the time you're doing it. So what you're really saying there is to all those people listening to the Champion Chat podcast, please do it responsibly. Yep. <laughs> God, did that sound like a cigarette ad or what? Oh, I remember those. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think that's uh, probably all we have time for today, Alison. Thank you very much for Thank all you. of your inputs and insights. Absolutely my pleasure. Always a pleasure. Love talking about sport and recreation. Keeps us together. Uh, well, I think we're all, I think we're all can't wait till lockdown ends and you know, maybe this rain eases up a little and we get to go out and do a bit more. Fingers crossed. Absolutely. Yeah. Very soon. All right. Thanks very much, Carl. Lovely well, chat as always. No problem, Alison. We'll see you next time for the champion chat. You will.
see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.